I've got a question here from Alan Wood. Do you have any plans to do more electric vehicles? Obviously, we had some great success with our electric ice cream van. I'm planning to travel the UK for 12 months in a motorhome, but don't really want to drive a dirty diesel beast or an expensive to run petrol vehicle. However, a new electric coach built motorhome costs around 150 to 200,000 pounds. So I wanted to take a classic motorhome and make it electric, but want something bigger than a transit. And I want something unusual and cool like this. Now, this is a 1988 or 1989 Vixen SE. It's kind of that classic 80s futuristic vehicle. Obviously, that future has now gone behind us. Thank you very much. But it's actually quite a cool, fun vehicle. And it's obviously not too big. Now, an electric RV is something I've been wanting to do for quite some time. And I think an Airstream would be the perfect vehicle. But actually, this Vixen would also be kind of interesting. And obviously, when you go for the electric conversion, because most RVs have an awful lot of space and the chassis or even those side lockers, you've got loads and loads of room for all those batteries. But also, it actually makes a lot of sense because you can run all your electrics through an inverter. You can have a 12 volt supply. You can have a 240 volt supply. You can even have a three phase supply on board. So you can actually run a welder, all kinds of stuff. But also, you've got all that lovely roof space and awnings for solar PV. And in fact, nowadays, you get these really, really clever showers that are eco-friendly. They actually make little bubbles of water rather than just drip. So that's another thing you could be doing. So really, it's actually quite a plausible idea. And the only thing to worry about is how far you want to go each day between charges. But frankly, then you could just wait wherever you find a nice place to park up for a couple of days, get a full charge, and then drive on your way. So it's a great idea. I'd love to have a look at that. So we should perhaps have a chat. Let's have another question here from Rocky Music Smith. What makes a car a car in terms of how much can you replace for it to still be the same car? It's a good question. With John's Range Rover, it feels like so much of it needs replacing. Would it still be the same car just because of the body with the sentimental dents in it? And could that body be swapped over and put onto another Range Rover in better condition? And would it still be considered John's Range Rover? Is there a combination of parts that makes a car a car? Or is it just a matter of personal opinion? That's a really good question. And it's one of those things I've quandered for many, many years, especially with all my comfy banana vehicles. Obviously, every time you built a sofa or a bed or whatever, obviously, that was the first question that DVLA asked. So that's the government over here in the UK as to exactly what is going on with that vehicle. And so obviously, if I actually kept the chassis and the suspension and the engine, all that kind of stuff the same, then I could just swap out the body, like turn it into a bed, and I'd pretty much get away with it. But in fact, well, we actually have an official answer from the DVLA, and this is one of the reasons why we can get away with such crazy conversions over here in the UK. So they say they have a point system when deciding whether a radically altered vehicle gets to keep its original registration or not. So the list is as follows. You have a chassis or monocoque body shell or a frame, that gets five points. The suspension, front and back, if they're kept original, that gets two points. Axles, both of them, both have to be original, that gets two points. The transmission, if that's original, that gets two points. If the steering assembly is original, that gets two points. And if the engine is still original, that gets one point. Now, the idea is to keep your registration. For this to work, you actually need to have a minimum of eight points, five of those, which need to be the original body or a brand new body, but from the original manufacturer. So you can see that actually, there is an official way of calculating it. Out of those 14 points, you need those eight. But if you get less than that, you end up with a Q plate in the UK, which just means you've got a car of dubious history, if you like. Now, obviously, you can't do a cut and shut. You can't weld two halves of a car together to make a whole one. You also can't have a car that's actually been already removed off the system because it's so badly crashed and then sort of reuse that registration, even though you can use some of the parts on there to make your other car OK, so now when it comes to John's Range Rover, obviously that point system does give us quite a good idea about all the bits we're going to need to keep. Certainly, we're going to keep the bodywork because of all those lovely sentimental dents. But it does mean that we could replace the engine. We could replace the chassis if it's a new one as well that we're going to replace it with. There's a couple of things we have a little bit of leeway on. So we'll have to wait and see, but we'll keep that point system in mind. Another question here from Josh Fox. Love the episode with your mate's gorgeous Mustang and its charging fault. Found it very informative. I'm currently having a charging issue of my own with a 2004 Subaru Impreza, a bit more modern than the Mustang. When the engine is sat idling and being driven gently, at all is well. However, when I put my foot down a bit, the charge light and park brake light flicker and come on the dash. If you ease off, they go out. I've also noticed that the headlights are flickering as well. Could this be a regulator fault in the alternator? Now, it was new in January, but a cheap one to get me out of a hole that, as you said, you get what you pay for. Annoyingly, it's an intermittent fault, and every time you get a chance to investigate it, it behaves properly. 
Now, I'm pretty sure that isn't the regulator in your alternator that's causing the problem. It sounds a bit more like it might be a loose wire in the dashboard, or perhaps if the lights are also being troubled by it, it could be another loose wire somewhere else in the circuit. So maybe something's arcing out, and that's why when you accelerate, of course, obviously the wires kind of move and walk to, move towards the dashboard. Perhaps maybe they short out the lights in the dash. It's really difficult to say, but obviously if it's intermittent, obviously that's always really hard to find. But what I would try and do is, Whenever it happens again next time, just try and repeat that action again and again and again until you're really sure what happens. And then try and, if you can, do the same thing maybe with the dashboard more apart, perhaps if you can get access to it. But really, it's just the first thing you need to do is be able to reliably make that intermittent fault happen again and again. And that hopefully will then start you on the path to success when it comes to solving the problem. So good luck with that. It does sound like a bit of a tricky one, but do let us know how it goes. Another question here from Ash. I recently bought a 1997 Lexus LS400, a fantastic car, real pimp wagon actually, amazing engine, um, for a somewhat cheap price. The car gives a lot of vibration after changing the tyres due to a cylinder misfire. Is a single cylinder misfiring a cause of such a bad vibration? The mounts have been checked and they're fine and the suspension and tyres are okay too, regards Ash. It is really strange that you should develop a misfire just after having your tyres changed, especially on that particular engine. It is silky smooth, a beautiful V8. You could balance a coin and rev it to kingdom come, and I'm sure it would still be absolutely fine and wouldn't fall over. So even with a misfire, I don't think, as it was really serious, that engine would actually vibrate that much. So the interesting thing is, it must be to do with the tyres, perhaps. Now, obviously, when you had your new tyres put onto your wheels, ordinarily they'd balance them, so they'd stick some weights around to try and counteract any deformities in the tyre or the weight of the valve, for example. Now, it could be that then, for whatever reason, either you'd just perhaps cleaned the wheels or whatever, or they'd just been painted, perhaps, the weights might have actually come off almost immediately that you actually got out of the garage where the work was done. And, of course, as soon as that weight is gone, if it was a lot, then, of course, it's going to be vibrating quite a bit. Also, it could be if the tyres weren't brand new, they were just new to you, that perhaps there's some damage, maybe one of the bands has split or something, or maybe there's a little kind of golf ball, if you want to call it there, some kind of deformity on the tyre that's actually causing this kind of imbalance. And it's amazing, even if one of the cords is broken, there's a kind of tiny deviation on that thread can cause a hugely violent reaction to the handling of the vehicle. So it's worth having them really, really properly checked very carefully, very closely with detail, and hopefully you'll find the problem. But it does seem very strange. I don't think those problems are related, but again, let me know if you found out otherwise. Now, I've got a comment here from a James May, clearly an ardent viewer. Now, it is that James May, and he is a lovely chap with brilliant hair. And frankly, how can you ever criticise someone who loves beach buggies? But on this particular matter, he's absolutely wrong. He suggests that humour dates. And although the orange was funny when it was first invented in the 70s, it is no longer funny because it is no longer the 70s, where actually he probably spent most of his time, frankly. Now, I obviously disagree with this, and I think actually it might be your sense of humour that has gone stale, and perhaps you need a little bit of extra zest in your life, so why not come on over, we'll go into the orange, drive around a bit, and you can see exactly how funny it really is. Thanks for stopping by the workshop. If you enjoyed the video even just a little bit, then click like. If you hated it, well then click like three times. Also remember to leave your thoughts and your questions in the comments. And obviously we'd love to see you again soon so please remember to click subscribe if you haven't already and click the bell for notifications of when the next video is published or when I have some intriguing news.